We read that over the course of the same kind of setting with a world around the values of commercialised to limit with corrupt religion and corrupt business on every hand. And uh, we try to witness the awesome power of the cross raising our church where it's present on the inflation season and nothing down whatsoever. And therefore the message of the Ephesians is going to be in present time. I like you folks to put this as much as possible by reading and answering questions and lots of points as well. The chapter 1 begins with these words, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. What does the word apostle mean to the disciple? Children of the Lord. Sent. Sent, right. It's one who is sent. The disciple does what? Oh, follows, right. Now, we find that Christ's disciples were such before Pentecost and after Pentecost they became apostles or believers sent to carry the gospel to the world. Now, at the present time, of course, we're mostly still on the learning stage and soon we'll pass on that to the apostles of the latter end period. Now, you're an apostle of Jesus Christ, but you are sent by Jesus Christ and not by the will of man, but by the will of God. If you turn back to Galatians, the first chapter, you'll find that the same kind of salutation is brought to view there. So, read verse 1, please, of Galatians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle, not through man nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. The same kind of declaration, isn't it? In the book of Ephesians. Pass across the Philippians, now you can find the same thing written down there pretty much. Well, not so much in this one. Um, let's, let's try Colossians. Yes, we have the same thing again there. So read verse 1, please, of Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Thank you. Now, likewise, you pass through the first line of other books, you find the same kind of declaration being made by Paul at the beginning of each of these epistles. Now, did Paul speak the truth when he said he was an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, not the will of man? Yeah. Absolutely, because we know the story, the story of God's calling him personally to go forth and be the preacher to the Gentiles. Now, if God left to the church to choose Paul, would they have they ever chosen Paul? No, no. Never, never, never. No way. Now, why do you suppose Paul then was so consistent in proclaiming himself to be what he was, the apostle of Jesus Christ? Was there a good reason? What's the question then? The question is, why was Paul so consistent in claiming for himself apostleship? Was there a good reason for that? The statement of faith. Yes, yeah, statement of faith. He was rejected for a long time because he wasn't one of the original twelve. Yes, I said he was never fully accepted. Never. Um, let's go back to the calling of the twelve. And as you recall, of course, Jesus Christ called eleven disciples, but who called the twelfth disciple? The disciples. Yeah, the eleven, right? And the outcome was that eleven were faithful to death, and one was unfaithful. Which one was unfaithful? Jesus, the one called a man, right? The one called a man. Now, of the twelve, which or who was the most uh, talented, the most able, the most uh, efficient? Judas. No, Judas was. He was the best educated and the most efficient of them all. And of the twelve after Judas' death, when you include Paul, who was the most learned, the most powerful, the most effective? Right. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go back to Acts, the first chapter a moment, to review our knowledge of the choosing of Matthias. Um, Acts, the first chapter. <laughs> this is the meeting presided by Peter when he made his final speech in regard to, to the coming of the vacancy left by Jesus' and death. I have someone read chapter 1, please, and uh, verse 15 down to verse 30, uh, 30, 26. So read, please. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, altogether the number 
number on the nation was about 120 and said, Men and brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled with the Holy Spirit, spoke and all by the mouth of David, concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased the field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, that the field is called in their own language, Akul Dharma, that is the field of blood. But it is written in the book of Psalms, that his habitation be desolate, and let no one live in it. And let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in, now among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed to Joseph called Barabbas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you, O oh Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which of these two have chosen, you have chosen to take part of this ministry and apostleship for which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lot, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven children. Thank you very much. Now, what a typical human election. <laughs> <laughs> Let's ask some questions on the positive side. Did these men have the best interest of the church at heart? Yes. Well, they most certainly did. Were they sincere in their actions? Yes. Right, most sincere. And were they right in their conclusion that Jesus' place must be filled? Yes. Right. But were they right when they said that someone must be chosen who had been with the disciples from the very beginning? No. no. That was their own idea, their own, their own supposition. Then they chose twelve. They chose two, rather, and that's got to choose what those two. It's quite a story. And um, men will always tend to defend their own works, and therefore we can be sure that the the other eleven disciples, for the rest of their days, tended to defend their choice of Matthias above God's choice of Paul. And for this reason, we find that Paul was never fully accepted by the twelve or by the eleven. There seemed to be a loner who uh, went, went about his work under God's personal direction and mingled to much of the other, other, other men. And for this reason, this is one reason then why Paul continued to declare himself to be what he was, the apostle of Jesus Christ, not by the will of men, but by the, by the will of God. Now, certainly, of course, some accepted that, and those who did, of course, were blessed in, in doing so. Now, when we come to Paul's final demise and the mistake he made in Jerusalem by going off that uh, ceremonial obligation, we find Paul there very anxious to remove the gulf that separated him from his brethren, especially the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. Do you suppose that this situation was a pressure on him? That, I mean, the situation, I mean, the situation where he was uh, not recognised? <laughs> Obviously. Now, from Paul's mistake, we must learn a very important lesson, that is that we must be unbending and uncaring about unjust uh, rejection of ourselves. Paul should have limited, limited himself to saying, well, God chose me, that's all that matters, and I'll go about doing his work in his way, where he directs and so on. He should never concern himself of trying to solve the problem of separation from his brethren under any circumstances. When he did a course, he found to and early death. So then Paul declared himself to be God's apostle, God's special messenger, sent to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles in particular. And he announces this over and over again in these great epistles which he wrote to these various churches. Now, verse, the last half of verse 1, we're back to Ephesians chapter 1 now. To the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, what is a saint according to Paul's definition? Converted person. Right. In person. A, a person in the life of God is present. The word saint comes from the word sanctified, I think. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, I should have derived a word. In any case, it doesn't mean a sanctified person. 
and sanctify for the Lord being made holy by the indwelling presence of God's Spirit and God's life. Now, what is the popular definition for a saint? <laughs> Yeah, they're all dead. First of all, they're dead. There's some person who lived some centuries ago, long before sure was a case of me, but who's regarded by the present generation being an outstanding uh, uh, servant of humanity and a servant of God. And they're canonized or, or uh, eulogized and put up on the pedestal before all the present generation. Now, it's worth noting, of course, that the modern generation of religionists always extol the message of the past and reject the message of the present. Is that right? In fact, uh, the Catholic Church today even recognises Martin Luther. Would you believe it? <laughs> In Time magazine several years ago, about 10 or 15 years ago, there was a huge article, which I wish I'd kept and failed to do so, reporting the Catholic Church now I recognise Martin Luther being a very important reformer who should have been listened to by the Catholic Church back at that time. <coughs> but he's dead of course and his voice doesn't speak anymore either to them. Now likewise when we come to Christ's own day who did the Jews recognise then as being great men of God? Prophets of the past. Like Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel and so forth all recognised by the Church of that but who did they reject? and John the Baptist. Right, today, of course, Christ is accepted, seemingly so by the churches, but in fact, he is rejected, of course. And if these men of the past should walk amongst us again, preach the message as they did back then, what would happen? Same rejection, right? Same rejection all over again. So therefore, the word saint, in God's terms, talks in terms of living, present people, in human is, is the presence of God's spirit and power, God's life, as distinct from dead people of the past who are who, uh, who judged by men and women to be saintly and righteous. I think I know too about it, but you don't recognize saint of the present. It's better than recognize saint of the past. <coughs> okay, come to verse 2 of Galatians, so Ephesians chapter 1, to my read it, please. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I feel this is a very important salutation to or being the sinner in, in, in this situation. <clears throat> now, what is the grace of God? Regenerating and lightning power of the Holy Spirit. Exactly right. From Greg Honors in page one. 394. Very good. That's, that's <laughs> also exactly right. It's the regenerating and lightning power of the Holy Spirit. The word regenerating, of course, means life-giving. It means to regenerate life in the person, to make them alive when they've been dead previously. It applies to all truly born-again Christians in this world of sin. The word enlightening means to educate, to teach, to clear up the mind of the uh, false ideas of the past and the present, and to teach pure truth. And the word power, of course, under the Bible is the regenerating, which means resurrection power, and enlightening power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so therefore the grace of God is not just an attitude on God's part. It's a power, a living, moving, working power which brings results in the life of the recipient. And where, where of course the grace of God brings in the life of God, you have the peace of God. Because He is what? He is, he is our peace. That's, that's told in the same book, chapter 2, Verse 14, is it? Yes, right. For he himself is our peace. Who has made one and has broken down the middle of the division between us. So Christ is our peace. So if you have the life of Christ, what have you got? The peace of Christ. Now, if you were an Ephesian living in that corrupt society back there, would you find comfort in the wished or prayed that you would have the grace of God and the peace of God. What do they need in that different environment? The power of God to keep them from sin and the peace of God to give them rest in the midst of all that iniquity. So I just three eleven is a very nice statement in this regard where it talks about the work of the Holy Spirit in the 
the life of a believer, which carries very nicely with the four weeks that we give Ephesians, the first chapter, page 311 in the book of Isaiah. Page 311. And it says that uh, Christ came to the spread of works of the devil and he has made provisions that the Holy Spirit should be given to him by the repentance of the kingdom of sinning. So God has made provision that the Holy Spirit shall be imparted to every repenting so I keep him from sinning. So the power of the grace of God in the Spirit is a defense against the power of sin. So that impartation is given to us for that very purpose. So Paul wished them then the grace of God and the peace of God from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we face, of course, this stupendous task of carrying the gospel of all the world in this final generation, a world steeped in iniquity and vice, immorality and corruption of every possible kind, a wealthy, powerful world, do, shall, we, shall we do without the grace of God? No way. No way. We must have the full outpouring of the grace of God in the latter rain power, because only then can we penetrate the darkness <coughs> and resistance of the world around the balance. It just they needed to back there to stand true, so we needed again to that to likewise stand true and go forth and stand the strength. That concludes the main part of uh, Paul's salutation of reading the opening reading to the church of that day and to us of course at the present time as well. Let's now see how he progresses from this point in verse 3, down for 2 verse uh, 6. I'd like to read it please. 1, 3 to 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Thank you. That was one sentence. What a long sentence altogether. Now, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, <coughs> who has blessed us, etc. What is another word for blessed in this context? What is Paul really doing when he says, Blessed be? Is he approving or disapproving? Okay. He's approving. So, what more is what he's doing more than disapproving? He is praising. Right? He is praising God. And Jesus Christ for various things which now appear in these three or four verses. Now this praise sprang from his lips spontaneously. It was not something which he said by way of form or uh, obligation, but he said it because he felt himself an admiration for an appreciation for a gladness of heart for what God had done through Jesus Christ for every Christian believer. Now, let's talk about praise for a moment. If we praise men, do we do well? No, we don't. So if we praise God in the same, same way we praise men, do we do well? Are you sure? I said, I said, if we praise God in the same way in which we praise men, do we do well? No, we don't. If we find that God asks us to praise him, does he not? And the psalm figure, of course, is full of expressions of praise for the Almighty and for the angels for Jesus Christ as well. Let's go to Revelation the moment to look at chapter 5, I or chapter 6, and note the uh, expression of praise which will spring from the lips of God to save you when that time shall come. Revelation chapter 5, and I'd like to read from verse 11 down to verse 14. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, thousands, and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb forever and ever. 
preacher said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. So he finds that this tremendous anthem of praise goes up continually before the face of God. It, it springs, of course, from the hearts of God's people in the, in the kingdom that's established. I used to feel that uh, I like having a little bit less uh, praising and a bit, a bit more activity, but I'm sure I see it differently now. Very much so. Now, we can, of course, uh, praise God as a works program. You can read in the Word of God where it says, Praise God. It's a right soul praising. That's a works program. That's how it works again. But the kind of praise that's being spoken about here is that which springs spontaneously and greatly from the heart which perceives and recognizes God's doing some works in our behalf. Now, as I read the Psalms in particular, I've been very much impressed with the fact that what those men wrote in the Psalm was, in fact, their own experience. Not just uh, theory, not just uh, something which they thought they should do, but something which, in fact, was their actual literal, literal experience. Let's go back to Psalms 47, I think, I've done this for the moment. Yeah. Here's one psalm, for instance, 48. We'll take 48, I think, is a better one. But to read that, please, there's only 14 verses. Psalms 48. All 14. Yeah, there's 14 verses. 14 verses. All 14 verses. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, which is holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth. Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great King God. God is in her palaces, he is known as her refuge. For behold, the kings assembled, they passed by together, they saw it, and so they marveled. They were troubled, they hastened away. Fear took hold of them there, and pain as of a woman in birth pangs. As when you break the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. As we have heard, so we have so we have seen, in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. So, we have thought, <clears throat> O God, on your loving kindness, in the midst of your temple, according to your name, O God. So is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of your judgments. Walk about Zion and go all around her. Count her towers. Mark well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces that you may tell it to the generation following. For this is God, our God, forever and ever, who will be our guide even to death. That is a sample, of course, which you find all the or most of the Psalms, this spontaneous outburst of praise that comes from the lips of those who perceive the greatness and goodness and perfection of God. Now let's think back uh, in our own experience. Think, for instance, of our message God's given to us, and as these truths are unfold before us, what has it produced in our hearts? Can I express the response of praise and thanksgiving, gratitude, thanksgiving, thankfulness. That's the only kind of praise which, of course, is uh, worthy of being given, that which springs for in our hearts and our lives. The when Paul says, blessed be the, be, be the God, uh, God, the Father, Lord Jesus Christ, was this something which spoke the very real consciousness of the beauty of God's character. Right. Now, it's natural, of course, to appreciate when things are, being, are going our way, when all, all kinds of good things are becoming ours. What do we naturally do? Great. But when things don't go so well, what then? We start complaining. We tend to start complaining, right? We should be praising more at those times. Certainly. That's hard to do. Of course, like glory also and tribulations, that's hard to do, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes. Sure it is. <laughs> but um, if we are submitted to God's will in those hours of darkness and can, can believe and um, be certain that God's working for our best good, we're still praising, aren't we? In the darkness as well as in the light. And if we, uh, that, that kind of praise, of course, is... Uh, Designed to produce in us that perfect submission which is required before we can fully receive God's power and blessing. So, praise power is a very important element in the Christian experience. Now, Paul here in 
includes God the Father and Jesus Christ in the next several verses again and again because he recognises the position and role of each of these great benefactors of the human family. Now he says, Blessed be the God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Now let's just, uh, I think it's quite important at this point, we go back and remember some of the great spiritual blessings God has given to us individually and personally and collectively in this movement and your own experience. What would you class as being the a great spiritual blessing that you've received? Yeah. Life of Christ in exchange for the life of the old man. That's right. That's a basic new birth experience. I'd like to stress the point, of course, that uh, as we're facing in the very near future the outcome of the latter rain, we should fall only on those in whom the Spirit of God is present, the life of God is present. It's very important we do know for certain that we are at the present time truly born again Christians. Two of you are all my when that time does come. And I would certainly agree this is the first and great blessing that we need, although not the first blessing, because there was, there was knowledge and conviction and confession and repentance and those preliminary steps that are all very important to uh, certainly great spiritual blessings. But uh, the climax of those, the first stage of our development, is being born again is receiving the life of God in our soul, in the place of the old dark night of sin, the old man to come by. Now, some more spiritual blessings that you have received. Blessing of the Sabbath rest. Right, blessing of the Sabbath rest, very good. And as I said the other day, every Sabbath has built into it a very special provision by God. And our task is to get out of the Sabbath, God's put into the Sabbath, right? And we come back determined purpose, we'll find that the Sabbath will yield for us a far richer blessing you previously have been experienced by the attitude to my own life, especially the past few months. Any further spiritual blessing you'd like to name? Character of God. Yes. Well, dear God. <laughs> right, the revelation of God's character. And that certainly is a wonderful spiritual blessing. Marvelous. The sanctuary. The sanctuary truth, right, the ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, for which he saves the government as it comes to God by him. Anymore? Consciousness of Christ. The word? Christ consciousness. Christ, Christ consciousness. Consciousness. It's a sense of being aware of that. Right. Your words being done for Christ, not for self. Good. Very good. Child yes. salvation. Um, child salvation, right. All these great truths. Yes. I wanted to uh, say that one thing I just really appreciate is. Uh, the ability to be content with the, the position that God has assigned you, whether it be housewife or laborer or whatever it may be. Because in uh, my workstation and as I look around on the world, I see everyone striving for some something better. They're not satisfied with what they have, and they're all reaching out for this, this something that will make them happy. And uh, I had a fellow who was in charge in our area once, We had talked a little bit before, and he came to me and said, um, he said, most of the people here, if you ask them whether this is what they would want to do in life, they would say, no way. And yet they'll probably be there two or three years later doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and he asked, well, he said, what, why do you stay here? You know, what's your reason? What are you getting out of this? And I explained to him very briefly that with me, the important thing character development and that um, every situation I was facing at work was in essence a microcosm of some larger thing that will be faced in the future and that if I couldn't, as it were, contend with the footman, how could I fight with the horse that people buy the same? And uh, <coughs> he listened and he said, you know, he says, that's, that's really something came to me later as he was leaving uh, to, to go back east. And he says, you know, I think you've got it. So, I have a sense that um, he could definitely see that there was something there worth worth living for, I guess. Very good. Very good. Joseph is the, the example of that disposition of spirit. It's quite a thing to work 
Uh, Frank's comment just reminds me of something I'd like to add. Uh, some of you know Mel Hansen, who used to be from the East now, or Midwest now lives in the East. I remember he told me when he was applying for a job as an auto parts deliverer in Tennessee, which isn't a very exalted or appealing job probably to most of us. But the uh, fellow who was interviewing him said, well, what are your goals in life? What's, what's important to you? And without flinching or thinking about it, Mel just said, why, to develop a character fit for eternity. <laughs> and can you see answering that to, you know, to an earthly uh, employer? employer. <laughs> he got the job. <laughs> Now, there's, there's, there's just another word now. What's the word that is coming up? 
because God has predestined how many folk to be saved. Oh. Everybody, right? Everybody. But will everyone be saved? What do they call a teaching that teaches everyone will be saved? Universalism. Like universalism. Now, it's a very nice and attractive doctrine, uh, provided, of course, in some miraculous way, each person is changed by fit to heaven or against the heaven. I wouldn't have been a heaven full of the present world's population with you. Thank you. Yeah. and immoral people and thieves and liars and cruel people and so on. So the idea of being filled with, with, with that kind of person is not very attractive. So the point is this then, that uh, every person is predestined to be saved and only those who apply or lay hold upon that predestination will find themselves eventually in the kingdom of God the Father. Now, coming back to verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. What is the objective then of being chosen of God? <coughs> we should be holy. Now, what does it mean to be holy? Without sin. Without sin, is that all? Again. Be spiritually righteous. Right, be spiritually righteous. It means to be without sin, but more than to be filled with the opposite number, which of course is the actual righteous life of Jesus Christ. It's a state of being, not just a, a uh, an attitude or a status. In other words, be holy, in other words, be, of course, part of, part of the verb to be, which indicates a state of being or quality. So the objective then is to fit people for a place for a place like the kingdom again. Now, I marvel at the simplicity of this now, it's still not understood by the churches of the world. To look in terms uh, of being saved by simply being covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not transformed to his likeness. Now, do the churches believe we can right now be perfect? No, they don't. Yeah, they seem to recognise that they must come when, when they become perfect. When they die, mm-hmm. taken to heaven, or have the second coming of Jesus Christ. But when must when, when, when must we achieve a holy life? That's right now, okay. But I've found that over the past few months in particular, it's been really impressed on really impressed upon my mind that uh, God does require and expect that we should be perfect and that we should be holy. Not the old legalistic uh, system of doing this and doing that, but rather the manifestation of the actual character of God, His love, His patience, His kindness, His righteousness, and His correct procedures, because the divine order is very much a part of God's kingdom. Now, it's, it's, it's very encouraging, of course, to find that God's purpose is to produce holy people it's too bad desire of ages, page 790 again. And uh, we'll note the terms of the covenant between God and Jesus Christ. Page 790. This, we've, read, we've read part of this before. There's a statement that was the covenant between God and Jesus Christ confirmed after the resurrection of Christ. From there, Bob, read, read the, the uh, last full paragraph, please. <coughs> Jesus refused. Then she? No, Jesus refused. Page 790. Yeah. <coughs> Desire of ages? Yeah. Jesus refused to receive the homage of his people. The third paragraph. Oh, Jesus refused? That's it. Jesus refused to revive his homage of his people until he had the assurance that his sacrifice was accepted by the Father. He ascended to heaven's courts and from God himself heard the assurance that his atonement for the sins of the men had been ample, that through his blood all might gain eternal life. The Father ratified the covenant made with Christ that he would receive repentance and obedient men and would love them even as he loved his son. Christ was to complete his work and fulfill his pledge to make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man 
than the golden wedge of Ammon. All power in heaven and on earth was given to the Prince of Life, and he returned to his followers in the world of sin, that he might impart to them of his power and glory. Thank you. Now, what was Christ's part of the, of the contract? To produce repentant and obedient men. Uh, 99% repentant? No. 99% obedient. Obedience plus repentance. Okay. Obedience plus repentance. Sure. Right. Of course, holiness is faith and obedience. We learned in Acts the Apostle page 51. The next study period. Faith and obedience go go hand in hand, of course. So Christ's part then was is to produce repentant and obedient men. God to accept them and to love them even as he loved his own son. And to achieve that, all power was given to Jesus Christ in heaven and on earth he might impart uh, of his fullness to of his power and glory to his people. So, so every provision is made to achieve God's requirement and God will bring forth a holy and blameless people before the end of time to finish his work and to inherit the kingdom. I guess the time has gone so we'll stop at that point. Any questions or thoughts about the in this presentation? Strong. And the disposition of man to run God's will, of course, is always very strong. 